Now, uh, I'd like to introduce the second panel of our program. Uh, this panel is toward actionable policy in climate change and human health, and it will be moderated by Laura Helmuth. Laura is the Editor-in-Chief of Scientific American and a member of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine's Standing Committee on Advancing Science Communication. She has previously been an editor for the Washington Post, National Geographic, Slate, Smithsonian, and Science Magazines. She serves on the advisory boards of SciLine, a program of the American Association for the Advancement of Science that connects reporters with scientific experts, high country news, and 500 women scientists. She has a PhD in cognitive neuroscience from the University of California at Berkeley and attended the University at Santa Cruz's science communication program. She is active on Twitter at, at Laura Helmuth, and I'm gonna turn it right over to you, Laura. Great, thanks so much. Uh, thanks to the National Academy of Medicine and the meeting organizers for bringing us all together today to talk about the important issues of bridging the policy and equity divide and figuring out how to understand and fix compounding health crises. And thank you so much to all of you in the audience who are joining us today uh, for your intention to and, and for your engagement in these urgent issues. Uh, and also I'd like to welcome all of the new National Academy of Medicine members. Uh, congratulations, so glad that you, that you joined, the, joined the club and uh, glad you could be here today. So our session today is titled Toward Actionable Policy in Climate Change and Human Health. In other words, what are we going to do about all of this, about some of the biggest crises, the biggest challenges, the biggest dangers of our time and future generations time, unfortunately. Um, so as, you know, as I think most of in the audience know, uh, Pew Research Center and, and other um, organizations have, have a lot of you know, really important survey data showing that a large majority of, of people in the United States recognize that we have had an increase in extreme weather, uh, that climate change is a danger to ourselves and our future, and they want um, policies to deal with it. They want politicians to deal with it. And, um, and we also find that, that people in the United States and other wealthy countries are uh, concerned and think we should be doing more. Um, and this is especially true of younger generations. So the popular will is there, but the policy seems to be lagging. Uh, and also the science is there. And this is maybe a little bit in contrast with the previous session focused on COVID, where um, you know, we were talking about making policy as the science was, um, was still being sorted out. Uh, but for climate science and for the impact of climate science on health, there's a lot of important science still happening happening, um, but the, you know, the, the results of it have been, have been pretty clear. Um, so we're going to talk about today about some of the policy challenges that science can inform and talk about how to include equity in every policy decision. Um, so thanks again for coming. Please add your questions. Um, uh, we, you know, we want to know what's on your mind, what kind of questions you have for the panel. And also we're hoping that the panelists will have questions for one another so we can have a robust discussion after the formal presentation or the informal presentations. This is all, you know, uh, fairly informal, conversational. We want to really talk in straight talk with each other today. Uh, so we've got a great uh, series of speakers and I'll introduce them in the order that they'll be presenting. Uh, we're starting with Dr. John M. Balbus who is the interim director of the new, as of uh, a month or two ago, uh, the new Office of Climate Change and Health Equity, uh, which was established um, at the end of August within the US Department of Health and Human Services. And he is one of the newly elected members of the National Academy of Medicine. And then our next speaker is Dr. Marshall Shepard. Uh, he is the Georgia Athletic Association Distinguished Professor of Geography and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Georgia and Director of its Atmospheric Sciences Program and a member of the National Academy of Engineering, the National Academy of Sciences, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And then we'll be joined by Dr. Michelle Bell, uh, who is the Mary E. Pinchot Professor of Environmental Health at Yale University School of the Environment, who also have a, has appointments at Yale School of Public Health and School of Engineering and Applied Science. And she is a member of the National Academy of Medicine as well. And then our final speaker, Dr. Michael Mendez, is an Associate Professor of Environmental Policy and Planning at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, so thanks again to all the speakers for joining us and uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. John Balbus to start us off. Thanks very much. Great, thank you so much, Laura. It's really a, a pleasure and an honor to be here today with this great panel. And I thought I saw my slides up before, so um, I'm gonna share just a very brief presentation about our office 
um, which is in many ways a, a first home within the federal government uh, for making this pivot towards actionable policy in climate change and health. So I'm just going to share our initial approaches to, to bridging that divide, as to use your language. Um, Laura, could I have the next slide, please? So just a, a quick reminder that um, our office was created as one of the mandates for the Department of Health and Human Services under Executive Order 14008 of President Biden tackling the climate crisis. And the mandates were to establish the office to stand up a new interagency working group that will work to decrease the risk of climate change to vulnerable populations, including children, elderly, and people with um, disabilities, and also to stand up a biennial healthcare system um, readiness advisory council. Next slide, please. So our office is um, taking on this issue of climate change and health equity in, in three broad priority areas that we're working. The first is working to reduce the risks of climate change or to build the resilience um, against health impacts of climate change for all Americans, but especially for those most vulnerable to the impacts bearing the greatest burden of current health disparities. The second priority area is to work to address underlying health disparities and underlying deprivations in the social determinants of health by informing as much as we can climate actions and investments such as the major infrastructure investments that are being discussed and planned now. And then the third priority area is working directly with the health sector on their decar decarbonization, reducing the, the greenhouse um, footprint of the health sector and also building resilience of operations and systems um, in the health sector. Next slide, please. And this is a schematic um, just to, to show how the climate change world meets social determinants of health. So the center colored boxes there are um, the, the pathways from upstream climate drivers like increasing temperature or sea level rise or increasing intensity of precipitation. Um, all the way down to human health impacts. And this occurs through a variety of exposure pathways. These could be extreme heat waves, wildfire smoke, flooding events, um, changes in, in the distribution or the intensity of vector-borne diseases. Um, and from a climate change perspective, we think about vulnerability in, in three different buckets, if you will, and those are on the left. The first is being more likely to be exposed. The second is sensitivity or being more likely to have a health impact given a certain amount of exposure. And the last is the adaptive capacity to, to avoid the impacts or the bad outcomes. And each of these realms of vulnerability is associated with social determinants of health. It's, it's not accidental that some people live in areas that are either prone to flooding or in urban heat islands. In many cases, this is the result of, of systematic racism for decades. It's not an accident that some people um, have underlying health disparities. There are communities that have much higher rates of asthma or respiratory, other respiratory diseases, obesity, hypertension, uh, mental health problems. And again, this is often related to, to living conditions. Um, and then the third is, is um, the, the variety of ways in which social determinants of health interact with people's ability to either shelter in, in a healthy place um, to avoid threats, to, to be able to evacuate, et cetera. Next slide, please. So um, these are the ways that our, our office is working to make this connection, to make this pivot towards, uh, towards actionable policy. And we'll build it out. Um, you can build it out eight, eight clicks. Um, it, it's a build out slide. So we're working to, to harness data and science to be able to identify the communities with the dispro disproportionate exposures working to address the underlying health disparities um, that I've referred to, asthma, diabetes, hypertension, um, all of which make people more vulnerable to either bad outcomes from uh, hurricanes and severe weather events or, or heat waves, working to, to both promote the research, but, but also to pivot to, to action and policy in terms of achieving the public health benefits of multi-sectoral climate actions, work in the transportation sector and bioswales and natural solutions to resilience, et cetera. Working to, to, uh, with both the, the federal and the private health sector to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, fostering innovation uh, in partnership with some of the innovation centers of the federal government in climate adaptation and resilience. Our office is, is a hub, as I've said, for climate and health. Uh, and so we're working to, to provide coordination uh, among the federal agencies and across the Department of Health and Human Services, 
We will be working to provide trading opportunities both within our walls, but also uh, in, out in the community and also exploring partnerships with the philanthropic and private sectors. Next slide, please. And the way we're doing this, and you can build this out, this is four clicks. Um, we are working within the Department of Health and Human Services as we've laid out in the recently released Climate Adaptation Resilience Plan to go one by one and to identify the, the, the best opportunities to be able to ensure that the, the resources, the, the, the quite large resources that HHS puts out into the United States and communities every year are, are doing the best they can to, to enhance the resilience of communities. We're also working um, recognizing that we can do all we want within the Beltway, within headquarters of Washington, DC, uh, and we won't have lasting and, and significant impacts in communities. And so we're, we're taking a regional strategy, working through our regional health offices, which have existing partnerships and existing structures to work both with the other levels of government, with state, territorial, tribal, and, and local governments, but also with community-based organizations and with the philanthropic sector and the academic sector on a regional basis to, to start to have these conversations, to work towards closing that policy gap that Laura was referring to. And then our office will be doing direct outreach grant making and as I, I've alluded to fellowships and internships. Next slide, please. So um, Laura talked about the, the policy gap and um, I hope that in our panel today, we, we can talk about how we close this. We have, as Laura said, really um, some of the more robust impact assessments for, for health in the United States that exist in the world. Our 2016 report was very comprehensive. And we have some idea of, of the ways that we can um, improve resilience through early warning systems, through energy assistance and air conditioning assistance. Um, but what we need to do is to understand at a very granular level, you know, where are we not meeting the needs? Where are the needs exceeding the resources or where are they needing to be redirected to ensure that we close that adaptation gap and, and make communities as, as protected as possible? So with that, I'll close and look forward to our, our discussion. You can just show the, the last slide. There we go. If anybody wants to reach my email address and also uh, the website of our new office. Great, thank you so much. And, and thanks for that excellent image of the, uh, the very dramatic bridge showing the stakes and the, uh, and the canyon we're trying to, to cover. Um, so thanks very much to John Velvis for our, for our sort of first uh, orientation uh, talk of, of this session. And I'd like to turn it over to Marshall Shepard to, to, uh, to bring us into the extreme weather climate gap. Thanks so much. Thank you, Laura. And thank you, John, for that excellent transition, because the extreme weather climate gap that I'll speak on briefly uh, is uh, really aligned carefully with your notion of a gap there that that bridge was crossing. Uh, there you see my coordinates. I invite any and all of you to follow me on Twitter because I, I believe in engaging beyond the ivory tower and academies, webs, uh, webinars, and so forth, which are outstanding venues. But uh, social media really allows us to get this information beyond our ivory tower doors. So uh, feel free to follow me uh, on Twitter. Next slide. I want to start with a contemporary discussion of what I mean by this extreme weather climate gap. Uh, many of us are recall just a few weeks ago, the remnants of Hurricane Ida uh, made landfall in uh, Louisiana, but then moved into the Northeast and we saw a, a secondary disaster occur. And this was a New York Times article, how the storm turned basement apartments into death traps. And you can see the distribution of who died in the New York, uh, New Jersey area from the remnants of Hurricane Ida. Uh, undoubtedly, many of those that I, I have uh, analyzed were people of color, marginalized communities, or poor. And so I think the reality is climate change has produced a scenario where vulnerable communities and vulnerable populations don't even have to be on a floodplain uh, out in a large tract of land, but even in an urban space when we see uh, intense rain rates due to climate change falling on impervious surfaces that don't infiltrate very well and run off rapidly and stormwater management systems that are designed for the 1970s rainstorms and not the 2021 rainstorms. Next slide. 
So that's one example of this sort of marginalized community or poor community gap uh, and vulnerability. Here's a more uh, tangible one from close to home. This is some research that I am doing with colleagues here at the University of Georgia, where we're analyzing the urban heat island of cities like Atlanta. And what you clearly see here is the urban heat island that John Balmas actually mentioned. And what we're finding is due to historical practices such as redlining and so forth, discriminatory actions, uh, a large segment of Atlanta's poorest uh, population and also populations of color are uh, disproportionately exposed to extreme heat. Uh, we have found that there are heat islands within the heat islands that uh, are disproportionately uh, associated with Black and Hispanic communities. So this is some work that we'll be reporting. But the overlying or I guess underlying point, I should say, is that these communities represent the extreme weather climate gap. Next slide. Again, I won't spend a good deal of time here. This is just how I frame uh, much of the research that I've been doing in recent times. Uh, I, I like to frame it in terms of hazard, exposure, vulnerability, and, and resilience. Using the hurricane example earlier from Ida, uh, Ida is the hazard. Uh, various people of all socioeconomic backgrounds are exposed to that hazard, uh, but there are only some, some people in that community that are vulnerable or have greater sensitivity. And then even of those, some have better resilience or the ability to sort of snap back or bounce back. So for example, if Ida's approaching my home, I'm, I don't live in the coastal area, but if I did, I have the socioeconomic means uh, to uh, move to Atlanta for a few days and stay in a hotel, or I have adequate uh, insurance on my home, or I have adequate health care uh, should I sustain an injury. That's what we mean by resilience. Next slide. Uh, this is a paper that colleagues and I published last year in Natural Hazards. Uh, it, it took those components that I just discussed, and we tried to project what we believe the most vulnerable counties in the United States are in the year 2040 from the perspective of climate. Uh, we, uh, next slide. Uh, we looked at the various vulnerability, and so there you see, and again, this is using vulnerability metrics similar to those discussed in the previous section session when I heard someone speaking about the CDC's vulnerability index. So uh, you can clearly see that along the southern tier of the United States and into the desert southwest and into Florida, uh, our most climate vulnerable counties uh, exist. Next slide. So this is where the weather climate gap comes in. Uh, I, the weather and climate gap is defined as a disproportionate sensitivity to extreme weather or climate events and a delay in the ability to bounce back. For example, as I just noted, uh, Black Americans are more likely to live in urban heat islands. And what we're actually finding in our most recent research is they live in heat islands within heat islands that uh, uh, increase their socioeconomic and health vulnerability as, as a, certainly relevant to this discussion today. Next slide. I, I worked at NASA for 12 years. I was a scientist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center before joining the faculty in 2006 at the University of Georgia. But it's not rocket science. This extreme weather climate gap is very much tied to this inequality in income. Uh, this is median household wealth by race and, race and ethnicity in the United States projected out to the year 2024. And that significant gap that you see between those blue lines and the red and orange lines tell the story of why there are disproportionate health outcomes and health vulnerabilities and sensitivities uh, when we see these extreme weather and climate events such as floods, hurricanes, or extreme heat. Next slide. Uh, I won't spend a good bit of time here, but uh, Bob Bullard, who is many, many considered the godfather of the environmental justice movement, basically makes the point that zip code today is still the most potent predictor of an individual's health and well-being. And we've got to fix that. I mean, from a policy or what do we do about it standpoint, we have to fix that very sound principle uh, that Bob Bullard often talks about if you see him speak or if you read any of his writings. Next slide. So with that, I will draw to a close. Uh, I look forward to discussing some of the things uh, that I believe we need to do to move forward in this regard in terms of both closing this extreme weather climate gap and also thinking about policy going forward. Great. Thanks so much to Marshall Shepard for that excellent presentation and for 
the very dramatic examples currently and in the future of, of uh, some of the health and safety risks uh, from climate change. So now we'd like to move to, uh, see, to Michelle Bell, uh, our next speaker, and I'll, I'll turn it over to, to her. Thanks so much. All right, thank you so much. Um, and thank you, John and Marshall, for those, those great presentations. I'm really honored to be on this panel and learn the insights of the panel and I hope the audience as well. Um, next slide, please. So this slide shows some categories of potential climate change impacts, many of which are already being felt today. And, and I find that much of the discussion on human health and climate change focuses on three key aspects that I've shown there. Weather or even more specifically heat waves, infectious disease, such as in increased habitat or behavior changes for mosquitoes that, that, that bring disease and increasingly discussions on wildfire smoke. But a point I wanna make here is that the environmental system and our health are incredibly connected so that each of these other areas that are sometimes discussed with respect to climate change separately from human health, in fact, could detrimentally impact human health as well. So just a few quick examples, changes in agriculture could affect food scarcity, could affect nutrition, uh, resource constraints around water scarcity can contribute to conflict and so on. And so this means that the, the climate change impact on human health is, in my view, far more severe than these individually highlighted components that are often discussed in the media. Um, next slide, please. So an example I want to use to illustrate this point is that of environmental migration or displacement, which also relates to, to some concepts in, the, in uh, Dr. Shepard's presentation. So in other words, who moves after an environmental disaster such as hurricanes or landslides? In this photo, uh, these set of photos are for landslides in Indonesia. And migration and the impacts of migration on health were studied by my former doctoral student, Kate Burroughs. So, Climate change is increasing the frequency and intensity of many different types of environmental disasters like hurricanes and landslides. And in fact, we should, we should stop calling them natural disasters given the anthropogenic climate change component. Um, but, but most studies in the past of, of many of these types of environmental disasters like landslides focus on the moving population and focus on issues of sanitation, nutrition and infectious disease and so on. But we also need to consider broader aspects of health. We need to consider mental health and well-being and think about the, the social, cultural, and economic systems that are impacted like social cohesion and things like access to uh, education, so educational opportunities. And further, we need to consider the health of the receiving communities as well as those that are moving. And so the reason I wanted to highlight an example of climate change health packs, health impacts that are in my view understudied is to try to focus on a broader picture of the, the public health burden from climate change. Um, next slide, please. And another example we could think about is wildfire smoke under a changing climate. So there's growing recognition that this is a critical issue, especially in, in light of the severe forest fires we've experienced in, in recent years in many parts of the world. And here I wanna highlight work by my former student, Lucia Wu, where we worked with the wildfire modeler, Loretta Mickley at Harvard to estimate what air pollution levels would look like from smoke under a changing climate. So if you look at the map of Alaska in the upper left, you see the percent increase in fine particulate matter from wildfire smoke under a changing climate. And now I ask you to compare that to the map in the upper right hand part of the slide that shows the residential patterns of Alaskan Native American tribes. And we see that if you, if you overlay these data, some subpopulations are anticipated to be impacted more than others. But what if we even just look at the present day? So if you look at the lower left, you see the, the wildfire smoke by month in the present day in, in the Alaskan Athabascan tribe shown as the top line in blue has higher levels of exposure from, from wildfire smoke in the present day. So the, the point I wanna emphasize here is that we anticipate increased wildfire smoke and associated environmental justice burden, but also this is not a new problem. Uh, this, so this really demonstrates how climate change problems are very often exacerbations of, of existing environmental health problems and existing environmental health disparities that we already have in the present day. Um, next slide, please. A uh, couple more clicks. Thanks. So, so next, I want to discuss scientific denialism and conspiracy theories about science. So this is a photo of a car uh, where I live in New Haven showing a bumper sticker supporting the concept that the world is flat. And lest, lest you think it, this is a joke, which I, I did a couple of years ago, um, it, 
it's not a joke. There's a substantial population, especially in the US, that sincerely believe the earth is flat. So going against science that we've known to some extent for thousands of years. And if you go on Etsy today, you'll find over 4,000 flat earth products. And if you go on Amazon, you're gonna find over 100,000. So when we talk about making science actionable for policy, um, we're often talking about training scientists and encouraging scientists to communicate, how to best communicate, how to best present our research findings. And th this is really extremely important, but, but here's what I think is the elephant in the room. Scientific denialism is different from a lack of scientific literacy. Um, next slide, please. And so the, the COVID pandemic, just one more click, please, thanks. The COVID pandemic has, has brought scientific denialism closer to home with real world public health catastrophes. And this is the same thing that is happening with the pandemic is happening with climate change, just a, a, bit, a bit more in slow motion, but with the same catastrophic outcomes. And so in my opinion, we need to admit that it's, it's not just an issue of getting scientists to communicate or a better graph to communicate that climate is real or you know, scientists talking to the media or even stronger scientific analysis or another document showing that climate change scientists are consensus. Be but because all those are really, really important, but they address a lack of scientific literacy. And no matter how policy relevant our science becomes, we have a growing scientific denialism that is, that is hindering the actual policy impact of climate change science. So I'm not sure what the solutions are to this issue, but I'm convinced it's more than science. And it involves social, cultural, mental health, economic, and, and other interconnected systems that pit people against institutions of authority, including science. And this is, this is impeding our effective policy. So we need to remember that, that we're in unique positions of, of both education and knowledge. And we can't and shouldn't expect the public to believe us just because we say so. So this disconnect between science and the general public really needs to be interwoven with efforts to address climate change policy, both for scientific, lack of scientific literacy, uh, but also for scientific denialism. Um, last slide, last slide, please. So um, I, I wanna thank you very much for your time and I look forward to our discussion and really appreciate having panels like this that really help try to connect science with real world solutions and bring science to bear on public health and well-being. Thank you. Great, thank you so much to Michelle Bell and, and thank you for bringing in the problem of science denialism and the fact that it, it, it's literally deadly. Uh, denying science has you know, exacerbated the COVID pandemic death toll and, and, and also you know, the, the toll of climate change. And uh, thank you for bringing that into the discussion, really important. Um, and now I'd like to introduce our final speaker, uh, Michael Mendez. And I'd like to add, in addition to his appointment at University of California, Irvine, he's also a visiting science at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NCAR. And uh, thanks so much, Michael Mendez, for, for, for finishing off the, the presentation part of, of this session. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here on this important panel looking at the intersections of climate change, public health, public policy, and of course, uh, environmental justice or equity. And I, I really have, uh, appreciated the, the previous uh, speakers, in particular Marshall, who focuses heavily and substantively on the equity dimension of extreme uh, weather events or extreme uh, climate events. Uh, I'm gonna be building off of uh, that work and looking more at a case study approach of looking at wildfires and particularly undocumented migrants. In California, you've heard we, uh, we, we've had tremendous amounts of extreme wildfire events. And oftentimes you hear of the economic toll that's happening to uh, our agricultural uh, industry, particularly our wine industry, which had a, a $3.7 billion loss last year in terms of tainted grapes or tainted wine. That's when smoke is infused with, uh, within the grape itself. It, it affects the taste and the odor of wine. Uh, but little is studied and understood about the workers, uh, particularly farm workers, undocumented Latino and indigenous migrants that are harvesting uh, these uh, wine grapes to protect them from, from smoke and ash. And little do we know about how this experience is affecting uh, their lungs and tainting their lungs. So in California, uh, we are experiencing uh, a major climate change uh, crisis. In the last several years, millions of people have been in impacted by multiple disasters. Uh, fires, blackouts, heat waves, drought, hazardous air quality, and of course the ever-present COVID-19 pandemic. These compounding of disasters have cascading health, social, and economic impacts. 
And due to existing structural inequality, these impacts are disproportionately affecting low-income people of color. In essence, wildfires in California and the Southwest are not isolated disasters. They often compound with other hazards and comorbidities, or what is called a syndemic in the field of public health. So now more than ever, it is crucial to understand how these events amplify existing inequalities and how to lessen the resulting harms, particularly in the context of extreme wildfire impacts to undocumented Latino and indigenous migrants. Next slide. Given their social status, undocumented Latino and indigenous migrants are particularly vulnerable to disasters such as wildfires and require special consideration in disaster planning. They are disproportionately affected by racial discrimination, exploitation, economic hardships, less English and Spanish proficiency, and fear deportation and their everyday lives, their pre-disaster marginalized status. So uh, we start with the premise, if you really want to tackle disaster risk reduction, it starts with the social integration of migrants before disaster, understanding that these individuals have a pre-disaster marginalized status and existing inequalities would only be exasperated during a disaster. In essence, when a disaster like a wildfire hits these communities, um, they have a form of hyper marginalization. Next slide, please. Our research in Santa Barbara, Ventura, and Sonoma County shows that undocumented migrants are often rendered invisible in the context of public policy because of systemic racism and cultural norms regarding U.S. citizenship and who is considered a worthy disaster victim. We presented uh, these research findings at multiple um, uh, policy briefings, both at the local, state, and international levels, including the United Nations Migration Agency. Uh, and we really highlight that political choices are being made that prioritize some lives over others. Next slide. To put this in context, 18 of the 20 largest wildfires by acreage in California have occurred since the year uh, 2000. And Sonoma County, one of our new research sites, an epicenter of wildfires and bastion of California's high-end wine industry, has suffered from multiple years of extreme wildfire events that have been ranked that have been ranked in the top five and top 20 for the most destructive and deadly wildfires in California history. Cumulatively, they have burned nearly 1 million acres, destroyed over 12,000 structures, and caused 34 deaths. While climate scientists expect wildfires to become more frequent and severe, it is important to explore how some people and communities are more affected by these events than others. Next slide. As Marshall mentioned in his presentation, such outcomes occurring during and after wildfires have major environmental justice implications and that, and that certain populations due to their socioeconomic status must live with a disproportionate share of environmental impacts and suffer the related public health and quality of life burdens. Moreover, in our research, we investigate how human identities such as gender, class, race, ingenuity, and immigration status intersect with wildfire disaster and systemic injustices. Next slide. Media outlets, governments, and uh, scholars across the country, however, have largely focused wildfire reports and research on the loss of coastal and hillside mansions and, and ecological systems and impacts to wealthy homeowners and farmers. The Sonoma fires, uh, however, not only destroyed expensive property and crops, but also endangered the health and livelihoods of thousands of undocumented migrants. California's home to an estimated 2.5 million undocumented migrants, many whom are farm workers or employed in service jobs such as housekeeping and landscaping. In Sonoma County, undocumented in individuals are estimated to account for 8% of the population or 38,000 people. Next slide. Governments in the region in particular overlook the needs of low-income indigenous mi uh, migrant workers and their families. Sonoma uh, County is home to a growing indigenous Mexican population. It is estimated that over 12,000 indigenous people from Southern Mexico live and work in uh, Sonoma County. Concentrated in labor intensive sectors such as row crops and wine grapes, ind indigenous migrants perform an increasing amount of the arduous labor, which contributes to the profitability and affordability of fresh fruits, vegetables, and wine. In particular, indigenous Mexican people in Sonoma County are culturally and linguistically isolated. Many are illiterate, and some speak neither Spanish nor English, but only their native languages, Mixteco, Friki, Maya, and Chatino. And it's important to note that indigenous Mexican people are not Hispanic or Latino, but indigenous. They are often homogenized with the general Latino communities. Next slide. 
While disaster reliefs in Sonoma fires have largely been praised as effective, migrant workers were especially impacted uh, from the fire due to the, uh, the loss of employment, violations of occupational health and safety standards, the lack of evacuation information in their native languages, prohibition from assessing federal disaster relief uh, services because of their immigration status, and poor infrastructure and housing in migrant communities. Undocumented migrant socioeconomic status uh, is usually precarious. However, the wildfire disaster only intensified their already difficult situation. Next slide. And I wanna end on two key public health uh, issues that are happening in terms of occupational health and safety. Oftentimes these undocumented migrants are asked to safeguard the wine grapes and other crops from smoke and ash and asked to enter into mandatory evacuation zones that are considered hazardous to the general population without providing with uh, any public health um, testing or care because of their immigration status. Uh, in particular of concern is five particular matter PM 2.5 from wildfire, wildfire smoke, which many of you know is a toxic mix of uh, heavy metals from, and other chemicals from burning structures and objects. And research has shown that this is actually more harmful than even vehicle exhaust. And then in California, annual mean uh, PM 2.5 exceedances has increased far beyond as the, uh, any other PM source uh, of exceedances in the state. So wildfire smoke is the main uh, culprit of PM uh, exceedances in uh, California. And then finally, the harm due to wildfire smoke to uh, farm workers may be greater than previously thought, bolstering the argument for additional research and policies to help safeguard the most vulnerable and stigmatized populations. Uh, next slide. And then finally, this idea of water, safe, uh, uh, safe drinking access to water. So when a wildfire does hit a community, first of all, it, it knocks out power, which may affect the water quality, uh, the water quality and the water, the community water systems. And oftentimes they'll, they'll send an a, advisory boil alert, which often in some of these communities are not translated into commonly spoken languages. But it's important to note uh, emerging research of the need to move away from do not drink to do not use uh, uh, odors because fire is causing other types of water contamination be besides fecal from sewer, sewer contamination by heating up plastic pipes, uh, which leach hazardous chemicals into water. It, it can also occur from uh, damaged depressurized water systems that suck us uh, smoke benzene and other pollutants into the water. So this is a, a map and uh, an advisory that happened in Ventura County, which had the uh, the Thomas fire, uh, the area in red is the area that needed uh, to have a boil alert and primarily low income Latino and indigenous immigrant communities. Of course, this wasn't translated into Spanish or native languages, uh, but it's important to note there was no follow up to see that there was benzene and other uh, chemicals that were in the community uh, water systems. And research has shown in other places like Sonoma that uh, there had been uh, 10 times acceptable level of benzene and other chemicals weeks and months after a wildfire occurred. So with that, I just want to uh, uh, end and say thank you for this opportunity to talk to you a little bit about some of the most uh, stigmatized and marginalized populations in our communities, the public health and policy implications of those, and how we need to work together to have more holistic and equitable uh, disaster and climate policies. Thank you. Great, thank you so much to Michael Mendez for that important presentation and for that final thought that we, we need to work together at all levels uh, and really be aware of who's the most vulnerable and, and that people who are in vulnerable, marginalized, sometimes stigmatized populations who are already uh, facing health disparities are the people who are suffering the most when there are climate emergencies. And as, as Michelle Bell said, um, we shouldn't even be calling them natural disasters. They're not natural They're because of the anthropogenic component um, and I, I just want to build on something that um, that Michael said about the media not covering uh, or disproportionately covering the impact of wildfires and other disasters on people who are wealthy, on celebrities, on the wealthy farmers versus the farm workers. And you know, I'm as a member of the the media, uh, I completely agree. And I think it's a big problem that the way we frame disasters in general is to focus on the people who are most um, most easy to reach, frankly. And, and the people in the most uh, conspicuous places who, who already uh, you know, have the relatively uh, more resources. And I think the framing that the media does around climate disasters could be a lot better and something we need to work on too.
Um, to, to start out our discussion, I kind of like to, to circle back to the to the beginning uh, with John Balbus and and John, um, your Office of Climate Change and, and Health Equity. Uh, you've got a big mission. You you're covering basically everything. When, you probably did realize this, but you know, obviously, from from this from this presentation, your your mission also includes things like immigration policy, and uh, and how people who are undocumented are treated and and cared for and, and protected in in the case of emergencies. Um, you got a you got a big mission. It's just a few months months out, but uh, would you like to to kind of talk about how you're trying to integrate these multiple? levels of analysis and you know investigation infrastructure investment uh how do you how do you where do you even start in the morning well thank you for framing it that way um you know it's kind of a both and thing so on the one hand um you know the department of health and human services is the largest grant making organization in the world and there are people and resources whose job it is to work with all of the different populations from undocumented migrants to Native Americans in Alaska to, to you know, impoverished people in, in our urban, you know, Rust Belt areas. Um, and so we're a small office, we're a small group of very committed and, and, and um, eager um, individuals. But we're only going to do it through the partnerships that we have. And, and, and that's why, you know, our, our our process, our strategy is to work hand in hand with the different divisions of HHS and then with the regional offices whose purpose really is to implement in communities the policies and practices of headquarters. Um, you know, at the same time, uh, it is a bit daunting and, um, you know, we, we will have to ensure that we're not neglecting, you know, and populations that, that are you know, not, not as front and center. And, and um, you know, uh, there, there's no easy answer to that part of it. But our approach is, is just to work in partnership with the department whose mission is to, to address the needs of, of all, all people in the United States. No, thank you. And so in the audience today, you know, we have members of the National Academy of Medicine, the other national academies. Uh, we have a lot of policymakers, experts in public health, biomedicine. Is there anything, you know, speaking to this audience, is there anything people in the audience can do to to help the work you're doing, to to participate? Uh, any any requests you want to make while while you have the floor? Um, so along the lines of what I've just been saying, the the solutions have to be pushed out. The solutions have to be at the community level, and and every. National Academy member is is also a member of a community. So um, to the extent that members are engaged in, uh, you know, in academic pursuits and, and are working with, with you know, very well-resourced and capable universities, you know, make, helping to make those connections with the regional HHS offices and with the regional health equity councils and, and to be a resource to communities will be part of it. Um, there's also a lot of research gaps that we need to close. And, and um, you know, there is, for example, um, just this past week, the Agency for Health Research and Quality, ARC, released a, a request for information for research on, on health systems research and climate change. That's a pretty new area. So, you know, I think there's a lot of academic pursuits about how do we make our health systems work in this system, you know, in, 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 this, in this arena. How do health systems contribute to community resilience, to community um, uh, improvements in the social determinants of health? There, there's a lot of, of implementation and innovation research um, for health systems that can be done. Um, so I'll pause. Those are two, uh, two ways, and, and I'm, I could talk more, but I'll stop there. Great, thanks a lot. And I just want to repeat: if, if anyone in the audience has has questions, uh, anything you'd like the the audience the the panel members to discuss, please feel free to put those into the chat box. We're eager to talk about what's on your minds as well, uh, and and also to the panelists if you'd like to ask one another things. Um, we, we 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 can keep this kind of free ranging. Uh, Let's see. And so I'd like to, to turn it over to, to Marshall Shepard again. And thank you so much for the, you know, the, the research you're presenting on urban heat islands, 
on uh, the you know the effect of flooding and how it's it's disproportionate and where it's focused. And also, you you, know, you mentioned that the infrastructure we have now, a lot of it was built in the '60s and '70s, and it, it was it's really not up to code for uh, 2021 for the for the future of of climate related disasters. Uh, are you are you so are you seeing any any communities, um, any cities, any states? starting to do a better job of building for climate resilience or uh, finding ways to to protect people to improve you know communication emergency disaster response uh, are there any areas of, of hope that you'd like to highlight or, or that you think could be could be addressed um, you know as as something that we you know that people could be doing right now yeah i think there are a couple of things that i have seen recently that really are important developments i think many cities increasingly have city resiliency offices or city resiliency officers. I think that's a step forward. Uh, I believe the city of Miami just did something very provocative. They have, I believe, the first ever heat officer. Uh, they have a person on staff that's uh, dedicated to uh, things related to heat. Uh, I believe uh, at least one other city in the desert southwest is planning to announce one as well. If they haven't already, I, I'm privy to knowing that that's possibly coming, but I don't know if it's public yet. So I, I think these types of things are encouraging. Uh, I, I, I do know that, for example, the infrastructure bills that are being discussed in Washington, D.C. Uh, are very much climate bills. If you dig a little bit deeper into the many of those infrastructure bills, there are things in there uh, that not only sort of enable the new uh, energy economy, which is part of the climate discussion, but this idea of hardening infrastructure or sort of revisiting infrastructure that was sort of designed or engineered for just a, a past climate that doesn't really exist anymore. And so I think the fact that jurisdictions from the local to national level are starting to talk about those things is important. I will close this remark set of remarks by noting though, and I'm adamant about this, uh, we must not engineer or mitigate or adapt to climate change in a way that is falling on the backs of those already marginalized or disenfranchised. For example, one of the things I've seen in my in Florida, South Florida, is many people now recognize the threat of sea level rise and are moving away from their uh, five, six, seven, six, seven figure condos in the coastal areas and moving inland to higher ground. Well, guess what? Some of that higher ground is in communities uh, typically populated by um, people of color or, or poor communities. So we have this climate um, gentrification going on. And so any policies going forward uh, to uh, deal with sort of inequities of climate change, infrastructure issues, economic disparities and so forth, they must be done in an equitable way. Great, thank you so much. And that, that's really important to hear that, that some places are taking it seriously, are starting to plan for the, for not for the future, I should say, so starting to, to plan for the present. Uh, that's, that's great. And I hope people will, you know, will uh, know and, and help advocate for, uh, for climate resilient infrastructure and planning in, in their own communities and their own geographic communities. Um, and some of the things you were saying about, about climate migration and climate gentrification uh, relate directly to what uh, Michelle Bell was, was telling us about who gets to move after an environmental disaster. And uh, Michelle, for you, are, are you seeing any policies that can help people who need to get out of dangerous areas do so and you know, build back in a, in a more equitable and, and safer way? Are there any, any things you'd like to highlight uh, in that space that you think are you know, policies that can or should be adopted? Um, I don't know if I have any specific examples that I wanna highlight. I do wanna echo what um, uh, Marshall was saying about how it, it is sometimes a bit, I don't wanna use the word easy, but it is sometimes uh, uh, an action that looks like it's a good thing, but may actually be on the on, on the backs of people that are that are the most vulnerable in the present day with with the growing health disparities. And I think that um, there have been some some work in migration uh, in relation to environmental disasters that look at the benefit of moving people in group. So if you move a community in group, what does that mean for social cohesion? And there's been some research showing that that might be helpful. And there's been some research showing that that doesn't actually address the issue of social cohesion. 
So I think that, um, well, I, I, I'm answering a different question than the one you asked. So I don't really have an example of specific policies, but I do think that our research and our policies should really look at these issues quite broadly. So using the example of migration that you brought up, looking at not just issues of public health with respect to you know, infectious disease and sanitation and even economics, but also looking at social cohesion, looking at mental health and well-being, looking at issues of self-esteem and agency within those populations, and looking at the receiving communities as well as the migrating communities as well. And, and you know, sometimes in this work, we see an almost U-shaped um, distribution of who's moving. So, you know, the, the richer populations that were, that were living in the, the mansions, they can afford to move. And then you have the poorest people who can't afford to stay, but then you have, you know, some people who are left that are really harmed. So, you know, it's, it's not always obvious to me anyway, how the distribution of impacts is coming out. And so we need to think carefully about these complex systems. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And, and thank you so much for bringing in the mental health aspects of of, of disasters and, and of migration and of, of uh, you know, all the consequences of climate change. That's a, a really important, important part of this that isn't specifically in our remit today, but um, that should be part of every conversation about, about climate change and policy and how to, um, how to mitigate the problems and, and help people survive and, and thrive. Uh, so thank you for that. And so we, we have a few questions from the audience and one of them is directed specifically um, at, at Michael Mendez. And the question is, uh, there's a worry that farm workers will soon only be able to work at night under bright lights because of the accelerated heating, especially in the California Central Valley. And um, the questioner would like to know, could you speak a bit further on this and the impact of the effects of climate change on agricultural workers and potentially on food production? So I'll, I'll send that over to you. Thank you. Excellent question. That's actually already happening. And it, it really it's really dependent on the type of crop that's being harvested. Uh, and my, our two research sites look at the central coast of California, which is Santa Barbara and Ventura counties, uh, which will be published in that uh, Geoform article. And then our new new project, which is funded by the National Science Foundation, uh, looks at Sonoma County. And wine grapes in particular are, have always been harvest, harvested at night. So you have a situation uh, where there's extreme heat. So in California, we never look at disasters. Well, we're generally, we try not to look at disasters as isolated events. We, we understand and confront it as a compounding of disasters with cascading health, social, and economic uh, effects. Um, so in, in when these wildfires hit in places like Sonoma, you have extreme weather events, or depending on time of season, extreme cold events that are happening. And these individuals, and then adding the layer of smoke that makes the sky dark and cloudy and hard to breathe if it's during the day or if it's at night. So you had situations where these undocumented migrants were uh, going to uh, emergency shelters if uh, they were uh, going there at all. Some were afraid to even go to emergency shelter shelters for fear of deportation. Um, and we had situations where farm owners and employers and, and supervisors would come in caravans and pick these people, uh, these, these, these individuals up at night from the shelters and take them back to, to the farms to harvest the crops, to uh, the, the wine grapes, to protect it from smoke and ash. With, sometimes with little uh, health, uh, occupational health and safety standards such as N95 masks, goggles, or uh, field sanitation. So that's currently happening at night. So imagine a, a, a disaster like a wildfire, extreme wildfire happening individual you're scared there's levels of trauma this has been happening multiple years and then you're picking them up from the emergency shelter and then taking them out there not providing them uh, with the proper health care post exposure uh, monitoring let alone uh, access to federal disaster relief funds or uh, and uh, health insurance so that that's just an intensity of the situation is currently happening and as the, the person that posed the question, it may happen, that situation may happen throughout California, Oregon, Washington, and the Southwest. So these issues uh, that the federal government has engaged in terms of intentionally not providing the resources for these individuals that are essential workers that are being asked to enter into mandatory evacuation zones um, and not providing with the proper uh, the social, economic, and healthcare benefits is a, a key importance. And I'd just like to end, if anyone wants to learn a little bit more about uh, uh, this issue, I presented the, the David uh, Endowed Lecture last week at the National Academies, and it should be 
available online soon. But yes, this is an emerging issue and uh, agricultural workers are being impacted in multiple ways by multiple disasters that are happening all at once. Yeah, thank you so much. And you know, today we're talking about policies, policies that can address climate change and human health. And it seems like in your in what you just mentioned, there are like four or five levers uh, that are policy fundamentally policy levers, like enforcing OSHA regulations and making them relevant, um, and disaster funds, the uh, deportation policy. Would you like to follow up on any of that? Sure. Uh, in terms of Cal OSHA, uh, which is our state office of occupational health and safety, there's only 26 field investigators in the entire state of California. Um, that actually speak Spanish, none that we know of that speak any indigenous uh, Mexican languages. And when the, uh, the Thomas fire occurred in Ventura and Santa Barbara counties, um, the, the regional Cal OSHA office actually closed down its regional office because it was too dangerous for their field investigators. But yet the, the people that they were uh, regulating, the farm workers, were still out there harvesting the crops. So more funding, robust funding, both at the state and federal levels, for occupational health and safety. Stronger smoke uh, and work safety standards are needed for these individuals. Uh, California was the, the first in the nation to adopt a wildfire smoke occupational uh, safety standard when the air quality reaches a uh, 1.5 uh, index. Uh, employers are required to provide N95 masks. We still see that that's un evenly enforced throughout the state. Some places are, uh, uh, some employers are not giving that to their employers, uh, employees that is. And then we even seen sort of in, from an intersectional uh, standpoint um, in the early years of this wildfire, uh, when volunteers, uh, community-based migrant rights organizations were handing out N95 masks from their own budget. Uh, they were giving them to the employers. The employees were chasing them off of their, the farms for trespassing or when they would accept the N95 mask, they would only give it to male farm workers. So the implication there that we, 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 we uh, analyzed is that they viewed male farm workers uh, more uh, uh, essential than the female uh, farm workers. So occupational health and safety, a, a statewide as well as a federal disaster relief fund for these essential workers, hazard pay, proper air quality monitoring, uh, pre and post exposure uh, to wildfire events. Um, those are just a few. Uh, um, that we can go, I can go on, but of course we have other questions. It's a really good start. It's a really important start. And thank you for those specific examples and specific levers, policy levers that, that could make things less terrible. Uh, and, and I'd like to bring in, uh, so in the comments, Marshall Shepard mentioned uh, you know, the, the need for funds. And this, this uh, builds on what M Michelle Bell was talking about, that we need to, you know, to help people escape dangerous situations. And yeah, Marshall, do you want to do you want to uh, build on what you what you mentioned in the in the um, in the chat that you know, this is a policy issue too? Is providing funds so that people can evacuate when there is a disaster? Yeah, I, I, and I, I know that everyone that can't probably see that what I mentioned in the chat, so I, I, I put it there to call out because I did want to mention it. So again, with Hurricane Ida recently, there was criticism because uh, the, the mayor and various stakeholders in Gulf Coast, Louisiana, and so forth, said they didn't have time to call for mandatory evacuations. Um, I think well, the hurricane sort of did something in meteorology we call rapid intensification. So people maybe went to bed to a Cat 2 storm and woke up to a Cat 4 or so storm. This is the era that we're in. We are in an era of rapidly intensifying hurricanes of explosively uh, spreading wildfires, uh, floods like we saw in the Northeast. And so we need a new playbook. I mean, I'm, I'm challenging policymakers, medical providers, uh, audio. We, we, we need a, a new playbook because the sort of two day threshold or window, for example, that policymakers need to call for emergency, three day window it is to call for or emergency evacuations or for contra flow on the interstates, that's probably not going to be good enough anymore uh, in this era of hurricanes. Uh, I used to be very critical of people that decided to stay uh, when there was a cat four, cat five hurricane approaching their city and our forecasts are quite good these days. So uh, we have a pretty good sense of where they're going within four, three to four days uh, or even five days really. Uh, I used to be critical, and there are some people that carelessly stay, but there are a lot of people in these jurisdictions that stay because they just can't leave. They can't afford to go get a hotel for a week, or they don't have the means, 
or transportation to hop on I-10 and, and evacuate to Houston or Dallas. And so I, and I, this is an idea that has been percolating more in my mind as I've watched what we've done in COVID. Uh, we are providing funds, we're providing stimulus checks and so forth for people to uh, have some resiliency against the pandemic. I, I think we very much need such mechanisms in this new era of extreme weather. That's great. Yeah, thank you so much. Really important point. And uh, so I, I, we have a couple more questions from the audience, but I wanna, would like to follow up on that. And uh, for, for Marshall or Michelle, uh, for John or for Michael, are there other lessons from the COVID pandemic um, that you think can illuminate how to address the climate disaster? And this could be you know, at any scale. And so, yeah, and, and you know, Marshall just mentioned uh, some of the things that, that are being done for, for emergency response. And uh, are, there, are there other examples? I mean, COVID, COVID kind of changed how we think about a lot of things and also made it clear that a global disaster requires uh, creative global responses, uh, whether it's a pandemic or, or the global climate emergency. So are there other kind of COVID-related lessons any of you would like to share? Uh, or I'll, 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 I'll quickly jump in and then let my colleague finish since I just spoke. I, I think COVID illustrates something that we've been saying as climate scientists for decades now. Um, experts like John Balbus and those and all of you in the health community knew a virus of this magnitude was coming. You've been warning of it probably for years to decades. And yet uh, was the planning adequate? I don't, I don't know. We've been warning about the climate crisis for decades. And what we're seeing happening is happening at the scale of what we warned. And in some cases happening faster. And so the lesson to me is that we need immediate action. We don't need more reports, uh, panel reports, IPC. We, I mean, those are things that we have to have as a part of what we do as scientists. But we know what needs to be done. We need to act. Sure, thank you for that, uh, Marshall. Um, I like to um, argue similarly, but I'll try, uh, like uh, flip it around. I actually like to like to add that the wildfire disaster actually informed our COVID nineteen pandemic response uh, on, on the ground level here in California. Uh, through many uh, years of interviews and last several years, advocates have really acknowledged that these extreme wildfire events have been happening for the last five years and disproportionately impacting undocumented migrant communities. Uh, created de facto public health experts uh, or disaster experts in, the, in, in within our nonprofit sector and migrant rights groups. These individuals, when there was no official government response uh, for these disasters, became de facto experts and service providers. And that had been going on for years. And that while the COVID-19 pandemic has been uh, horrendous to the uh, farm worker community, they all comment that it would have been far worse had it not been for those years of building social infrastructure, of identifying these hard to uh, reach populations or populations that are rendered invisible by political choices that uh, state, local and federal government are making not to provide a uh, disaster release uh, resources and services before disaster hits. So many of them commented that has provided the inroads to creating this infrastructure from a testing to occupational health and safety, uh, social distancing, and of course, finally, to uh, vaccine rollout. Uh, so these are all interconnected things. And, and one issue that has really come uh, up in terms of uh, the linkage between COVID, um, these other compounding disasters, again, is that mental health. Individuals are living in these communities year after year uh, while these disaster, compounding disasters, these pandemics are happening. And th there's a sense of uh, disaster fatigue, of constantly being on edge and dread that the next wildfire season, the next pandemic is happening while the, these individuals are still dealing with the other issues, social, economic, and health issues in their everyday lives. So uh, the, the, these disasters and these events are all interconnected and there are some learning process, processes. Uh, unfortunately, they all happen because there was really no official government response um, during some of these initial disasters. I just offer a couple of perspectives. It's a lot of, on the one hand, on the other hand, kind of, of lessons from, from COVID. Um, in November of, of 2019, there was a, a rating, and I'm blanking on who it was, whether it was World Bank or World Economic Forum, of, of countries' preparedness for pandemics. And the United States was ranked at the very top of the list. Uh, and, then, and then COVID hit in, in February of 2020. And I think that, that we learned that, you know, 
having a plan is is essential, but it's not enough. Um, and that um, the way that we assess our preparedness needs to be a little more nuanced, a little more sophisticated. And, you know, in, in, in this case, ensuring that, you know, the plan that's held, you know, is in a file in a government office is, is tested, is, is, is practiced, and is, you know, kind of bought into by the populations and that, that will be the ones that, that need to be helped. Um, and, and the real, kind of a related lesson is, you know, on, on the plus side, I think the COVID pandemic showed the incredible power of the health sector of the United States to mobilize in the face of a severe threat. Um, you know, some of the, 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 provi the provision of a, of a vaccine in the time frame that was done is, is, is pretty remarkable. And yet at the same time, as Michelle's talk really pointed out, um, you know, even having the scientific and technical solution to the problem uh, isn't enough. Uh, and it has to be accepted and it has to be something that that um, that that we overcome the denialism. And, you know, I, I think with climate change, we're seeing a threat that is, you know, on a similar scale, but not on a, sim a similar magnitude, but not on a similar time scale. And it's cognitively very difficult, I think, for a lot of people to to, you know, think that we need to do as much for climate change as we had to do, you know, to mobilize our health sector for COVID. Um, and at the same time, we have to overcome the denialism against this reality that that is impairing our ability to mobilize the resources to address it. Yeah, I'd like to add one more point, building on some of the comments that that my colleagues have said on on um, on Michael's point of the, the interconnectivity between existing uh, climate change issues and social disparities. Um, I, I think that the, the COVID-19 pandemic has, has, has shown us that you know, we have a strong disconnect between science solutions and science action, but we also have this incredible ab ability to, to mobilize. And so the, much of the discussions about COVID-19 correctly were on disparities or, and, and are and still continue to be on disparities in who is impacted by COVID-19, you know, which, which sub, subpopulations have the highest mortality rate and so on, and relates so much to issues of healthcare and access to information and um, a lot of other issues. And so I think that this connectivity between social and economic and cultural systems with science, with policy and with solutions was really highlighted in the COVID-19 pandemic and is something we need to keep in mind for climate change as well. And these are great points. Thank you all so much. Uh, so I'd like to, to shift the conversation a bit uh, based on one of the questions that came in, uh, which it makes a really important point. The, the way that we'll get long-term action is by recruiting more people to be studying, working on these issues. Uh, and so the question is, how can we support and, and recruit, frankly, early career scientists and physicians who are interested in working on the intersection of climate and health? And uh, in particular, any advice about funding, about career developments? Um, do you want to, you know, issue a issue a recruiting call to to tell people this is really important work and they should come join you all? As probably the only early career uh, scholar, I'm assuming uh, on this call, um, I definitely the funding for more integrated social science perspectives. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the National Science Foundation. Um, has really been supportive of this research, as well as the uh, NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, and really bringing together scientific uh, practices and disciplines together with sort of that qualitative ethnographic uh, policy action of the social sciences and working together to really um, uh, focus on issues that are hard, uh, often understudied, um, either because they're controversial, such as undocumented migrants, or um, not always seen as a valid area of study. So uh, I think having more programs for early career scholars that provide some with more independent and more longer term funding is of key importance. And then also I think as scholars too, um, in the research that I do, I, I take from a very co-productionist framework that I, I co-author the, the disaster studies research with the communities that I, I am studying. They are co-authors, uh, they, they help in the research design, the data collection, and the corresponding solutions and of course the policy briefings and providing that sort of empowerment instead of the extracted research uh, process uh, is quite important particularly when you're studying a very marginalized not only marginalized but very stigmatized exploit exploited uh, population i think providing that uh, true principle of environmental justice uh, of giving them uh, a platform to speak for themselves is quite important as well <laughs> 
And, and I, I, I would jump in and add, I, I, one of the things I've really been advocating for here at the University of Georgia and broadly in the ivory tower in general is we need to fundamentally reshape how we train from a professional development standpoint scholars. Um, here in the academy, we do a really good job of teaching graduate students how to write dissertations and master's theses and present at conferences and write papers for journals. And that's fine. They'll get 400 reads or maybe 100 citations or 50. Uh, we need to uh, train them how to engage in the public policy space and how to write op-eds and write and speak to the media and have media training and those things. I, I fundamentally believe we need to uh, have what's called an end-to-end -end scientist approach. Um, we've got to sort of move beyond the inertia of the current model for what an academic scholar looks like. And I mean, I think this sort of popularizer myth is dead, that prehistoric thinking that scientists or stakeholders that engage beyond the ivory tower are somehow less, less serious as scientists or not as uh, adequate as scientists are, I think that's has to go. I think we have to incentivize tenure and promotion structures so that uh, young scholars and students and even young assistant professors don't think doing all of that is extra stuff, but actually a part of the engagement of scholarship. So that's that's something that I would advise. I think scholarship is important, but if we're pivoting to action policy and solutions that are distributed throughout all communities, it has to go beyond research, it has to go beyond professors and early career researchers. And, you know, I think as the fund, they'll, they'll move where the funding moves and as the funding increases in this area that, that that will generate more scholarship. But we also have to educate all health professionals and in fact, all people in this country, but we're the National Academy of Medicine and, and you know, the, the new action collaborative on decarbonizing the health sector is looking at just that. You know, we, we have to put all health professionals, not just doctors, not just nurses, uh, but all people working in hospitals to 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 work on the solution space. Um, it, it's not it's not just a, an academic exercise. It has to be you know an occupational exercise. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, so we have time for maybe one more question, and this is uh, maybe something for the for the audience uh, to kind of help them do their next steps. Uh, if anybody wants to pursue more understanding of the issues we've been talking about, and the, the question is, can you can you name this is from the audience? Can you name an organization or locality that you admire for its approach to the problem of cli of, of climate and inequity? Um, are there any lessons learned, you know, from groups, entities, individuals? Uh, that that people from the audience could emulate or endorse or you know help spread around the world. Uh, so if there's any you know any any program, any people, any organization you want to give a shout out to before we end, um, that might be kind of a, a hopeful launching point for people to go move move from this discussion. Yeah, I, I would mention the Institute for Sustainable Communities because I sit on their board. Uh, they're an organization that really thinks carefully about sort of uh, equity and climate change and and health and social economic well-being and so forth not just here in the u.s but around the world uh, I've, I've become very impressed with them as I've, I've been able to sort of learn more as i've served on their board now for a little over a year so that's the institute for sustainable sustainable communities or isc like that there's various uh community-based organizations that i work with one that comes to mind is my cup the misteco indigenous community organizing project that again, has become de facto climate experts, de facto disaster uh, service providers and experts themselves. And they really, uh, them and other community-based groups really understand that, uh, yes, scientific assessments and scientific studies are much needed, but none of them will ever be implemented without some exercise of political power. So the need to link science into uh, policy action is quite important. And having a public advocacy campaign focused on local state, elect uh, and federal elected and appointed officials is quite key uh, to in ensuring that we have social change. Great, thank you so much. Any other organizations anybody wants to give a shout out to for, for the audience to, to look into? All right, these, these were great questions. So I wanna thank everybody in the audience for coming, for joining us, for, for thinking about these important issues, for submitting your questions. And thank you so much to our panelists, uh, to John Balbus, to Marshall Shepard, Michelle Bell, and Michael Mendez. Uh, thanks for the research you're doing and thank you so much
for joining us today and, and sharing uh, your insights about how to improve policy and, and climate equity. And uh, I think we're going to a break now. I think I'll turn it over to Sue Curry maybe to, to, to do the, the, um, the next announcement of, of where the conversation will go from here. Great, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Laura. <laughs> and uh, let's see, we have John on the thing. Um, Eventually, I'll show up on camera. Uh, so, I, can people hear me? Yeah, you sound good. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, so, I want to thank uh, panel two for uh, just a remarkably insightful, informative, um, and stimulating uh, set of uh, remarks and, and discussion. Uh, on how policy can address climate change uh, impacts on health. And I'd like to invite people to thank, uh, to join me in uh, thanking this panel.